Well, good morning, Hope Collective. How is everybody today? Good. Good to be with you. Let's all stand together as we come into God's house. Uh, longing, I think, at least, it, I don't know about you, but I woke up with a, a deep longing for the things of God today, for the things of heaven, for the kings, the things of the kingdom of heaven to happen in this place. And so today we open our time together by reading together uh, from Psalm 27. And if you would, as we've been doing before, uh, just, just put your hands out like this in front of you in a posture of receiving. The words will be up on the screen. I'm, I'm reading out of the NLT if you have your Bible with you. Um, but we're going to spend today just, just at this first moment opening our hands and saying, God, would you come and fill my heart and let the praise that comes in this moment be an overflow of your goodness. This is Psalm 27. This words will be up on the screen. Let's read this together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? When evil come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Can we give our God a shout of joy and praise as we welcome him here today? Let's sing and worship our God with everything that we have within us to the one who gives us all that we need. Here we go. When I can't I see When I can't take another step Lord would you carry me And when I lost my fight Will you be my strength Will you set me a table in the presence of my enemies Sing it with all your heart I shall not want I shall not want I shall not want Oh, my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not want. Cause my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not want. And I will leave my eyes to where my help comes from.
Lord, you are the God above every God, the one who sets us safely upon a rock, protects us from our enemies and fights for his people. We worship you in your house, God. It gives life to us and it gives life to this family, God. We praise you and give you all the worth you deserve. In the darkness, we were waiting with our hope, with our light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to. shout his praise in this house today welcoming the father the son the spirit who's alive and moving god we give you praise and honor last week if you're with us you'll know that 
during our time of singing, we, we, we made a challenge to push deeper into a place of worship that might not look like the worship that you and I have typically experienced in church growing up or even last week necessarily. But we said on this journey that we're going on of being transformed from the inside out, that if we want to see God do a new thing within us, we must be willing to posture ourselves in a new way. And during that time of, of, of worship and singing and responding, we didn't just experience the first half of Jesus' greatest commandment to us, which was to love God. Typically, that's what we do really well in this time as we sing songs of adoration and praise to God. We just did that with those first two songs. But we also practiced loving one another the same way that he would love us. And we see, yeah, I love that in that song, it talks about how when the church of Christ was born, I think about that moment, I think about that century, how the church would not have been a group of people necessarily gathered around a stage but it would have been a lot more like what we saw in the Last Supper, right? It was Jesus teaching around a table. It was them singing a hymn together before they went out. And then at the beginning of that time, if you recall the story, Jesus strips off his outer robe, bends down to a knee and begins to wash the feet of his brothers that are in the room. And I think that if we, if we think of church more through the, the lens of that, I think we'll begin to experience the height of what a worshiping community that actually experiences the presence of God and the kingdom come of God on earth and in this room. I think that's when we begin to experience the things of heaven uh, on, on behalf of our brothers and sisters. And so after last week, um, just spent some time literally in this room, looking out on the seats, standing right here in this space and wrote down just a list of things, a list of needs, if you will, like soul needs, heart needs that could be present in the room. And what I'd like to do is, is just to, I think just to kind of give us all a point of reference is to read through this list. And if, if this resonates with you, not hesitating, but just stick your hand up for a couple of seconds so that the people around you can see, not like the slip hand up, put it back down, hiding, right? But a full on like, no, admission that this is me today. And I wanna be honest enough in this space to be able to do that. So if this is you, I'd love for this community to understand that there are needs present, that when in love, we can during this time like, kind of treat this time more freely. We can actually, as brothers and sisters, rally around one another and meet those needs, okay? It's kind of a long list, so I'm gonna fly through it here. You find yourself weary or beat down and you are in need of a word of encouragement. Hands. You are worried about the physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual well-being of your kids and you're in need of comfort. Me too. You are tired from trying to prove yourself and earn your worth, value, and significance, and you need to know that you are enough. You've been traveling or away from home, and you're in need of someone to tell you that you can rest, cease striving, and receive goodness. Yeah, I see you. You're overwhelmed by the pressure put on you by yourself or others, and you need to know that you're loved just for being you. I hope you see one another here. You feel a sense of purposelessness, and you need to know that you are of value to this world. You're distracted or struggling to be present and you need someone to pray peace over you. Yeah, this is me right here. You feel unexplainably under attack, whether that be mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, and you need someone to fight for you. You're new to this community and you need to know that this isn't fake. Yeah. Welcome, by the way. The information that you've been learning isn't changing you and you need someone to pray with you into transformation. You're doing all the right things on the outside, but your heart and your soul are still broken and empty. Do you feel the weight of this church? When we say family, when we say community, we mean that we, mean that we help meet one another's needs. And so I have a second list. I'm gonna go a lot faster through this one, but these are the attitudes, the postures, the beliefs, the thoughts, I will say the lies that would keep this from happening in the room today, okay? I'm not gonna make you raise your hand, but this is the list of things. I'm gonna do it wrong and people will judge me. 
God isn't speaking to me. These are just my own thoughts. It'll be weird or awkward. Someone else will do it, so I won't have to. I'm an introvert. Surely this doesn't apply to me. I'm an extrovert, and I'm going to be too much for other people. Can I just get the message so I can go to brunch? It's my first time here. If it is, you're welcome here. We, we, we're so glad that you're here, but don't let your first time being here mean that you can't act in love on behalf of a brother or sister in Christ. I've been here 20 years and I've never had to do this before. Why should I have to now? I debated on whether to say these next two, but again, God's spirit speaking to me, okay? <laughs> Just trying to discern here. I'm a man and this is too soft for me. I'm a woman and I'll be stereotyped as too emotional if I choose to participate. Nobody's done this for me. Why should I do it for someone else? I am at playing an instrument, leading worship, or running tech. If I leave my post, Alex will be mad at me and things will fall apart. Not true. Not true. You are family as well. You are family as well. If you don't see lyrics for these next songs, Isaiah must be praying for somebody somewhere. <laughs> I'm too broken or messed up to do the work of God. I'm afraid of what fill in the blank might think of me. Your view of gathered worship is individualistic and not communal. Your view of faith as a whole is personal or individualistic and not communal. And lastly, you care more about gaining your life than losing your life as Jesus taught us to do. And so I'm gonna ask us as we saw the needs that are present in the room too in the next 10 minutes here, to do one of two things. The first is to, as, we, as you hear us say around here sometimes, go and pray your best prayer for the person that you, that you feel God's spirit is leading you to be near. Or the second is this, if that's too much for you, just maybe throw an arm on their shoulder or just say, I'm here and I'm with you and stay with them through this time of worship, okay? That was a lot. We're gonna take about 10 minutes to sit in God's presence here and meet the needs that we know are present in this room today. Let's let God's spirit lead. Lord, would you come and teach us to love you, but also to love one another. That you teach us that this space is not just about receiving, but it's about stripping off the outer robe and washing one another's feet. And Lord, I believe with all my heart that the heights of this worshiping community will not be hands raised or songs sang or how good things sound. It will be the depth to which we are willing to serve one another. And so, Lord, come and have your way. Speak truth over lies. Illuminate darkness. Give us Holy Spirit insight into how we can fight on behalf of one another.
already loved. I'm already loved. I'm already asking the room for a show of hands if you still feel that you're in need of a hand on your shoulder to pray with you through a need would you put your hand in the air right now just boldly honestly before the community yeah. uh, for the rest of everybody who's standing around those people well, can we gather just around those who may still have what we said is this heart need and this soul need I know that this is different I get it but like we said we need to posture ourselves in a different way if we want to see God actually break the things that have stood for far too long in us right we're gonna spend time closing this time by praying over the needs that are in this room, every one of them, even those that might be unacknowledged, um, and inviting the Holy Spirit to come and overflow us into love for these individuals. Holy Spirit, come and speak life. Really simply, just speak life, speak life. Lord, the things that we stated that we are believing that are creating this, this poverty of soul and this, this depth of us that is going un, unsatisfied and unquenched, God, is created by lies of the enemy that tell us that we are not enough and you are not enough. And so I pray that today you would come and cover those lies over with truth that you'd root them out, Lord, and in that place sow seeds of truth in these individuals that say, not only do you love them, but there is a family and a community with arms on their shoulders right now who are here to speak life and edify and pick up and carry with even through the darkest valley. We know, Lord, that you cast out all fear, but you don't do it um, vindictively, God, you do it in perfect love. And so let perfect love exist in this room, God. When we saw you pray, Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done. We say in this room as it is in heaven. And God, that means perfect restoration of belief in you. That means hope that is renewed. That means lies that are, are stomped out, God. And so we pray today, Lord, that you'd come and have your way. That our worship would not just be songs around a stage, but it would be love within a community that washes one another's feet, that shares life together, and that carries one another through even the deepest valley. Come and have your way today, God. Speak like only you can, and we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a shout of gratitude, I think, and praise in this place? Amen. Amen. Kate, go ahead and come. You can go ahead and take a seat, church. Okay. So I think we all just need to be like, <sighs> Jesus, come. Amen. Introverts, how you doing? You all right? Okay, good, good. Well, my name is Kate, and I am with Hope Co. Kids, the coolest ministry at the Hope Collective. And I am uh, thrilled to be up here today because I am just so blessed to have just been a part of that. Usually I'm downstairs, so to be up here has been a great time, and I know that you have all felt it too. So can we thank Alex and the worship team just for leading us through that. Well, I have a few little things to chat about today, but first I just want to say a big, huge welcome if you are a guest this morning. We are so glad that you joined us this morning on this beautiful day. We know that life gets busy, and we know that there are a million other things you can do, but you have chosen to be here with us today, and we welcome you to the family and are so glad that you are here, and we would love the opportunity to get to know you a little bit more. So if you are a guest this morning, you can do a couple of things. You can text HOPECO to 97000, and someone will reach back out to you. You can also stop by our community corner out in the hallway, and they can kind of tell you how to get connected, um, answer any questions that you may have, and all those good kinds of things. But we're so thrilled that you have chosen to spend this morning with us, and we know that God is going to do some amazing things to us and through us this morning. Amen? Amen. Well, can I share a little story? Can I share a kid's story with you real quick? I mean, even if I can't, I have the microphone. <laughs> My time has finally come. So therefore, 
I want to share a little story from the summer. And I know summer was a ways back. And this is my season. So to go back to summer makes me feel a little, you know, shaky. But I want to share an amazing story about generosity. And the kids here at the Hope Collective, we did a vacation Bible school this summer. And we had like a, a little collection, if you will, because we were talking about how do we build bigger tables like we've been talking about with Give Hope, right? How do we big, build bigger tables? How do we invite kids who may not have a home base or may not have um, a family that, that can support them or may just need a place to hang with other kids? And part of that is giving back to our church here as we start ministering through our Hope Center and through our community and through all the great things. And so we decided on the last day we were going to do a collection of coins. And they were going to look for their pennies and their nickels and their dimes. Now, one child did go home and tell their parents, I need all the green money you have. And so, and the parent gave that to them, which, you know, I thought that was pretty impressive. But so I'm like, okay, we're just going to get a couple little boxes. They made a box in art. They're going to collect all the things, right? And so I asked um, Pastor Dave, I said, would you come up and just receive it and, you know, pray with the kids or whatever? Well, we started singing. I laid out like a couple of offering baskets and one by one, all of these children came forward and poured out their banks and all their green money into these baskets. And I think we had maybe three buckets filled and that is the generosity of children. And one of the things I love most about children is they don't question when God tells them to do something. They said, I have a childlike faith. And this is a way that I can help my church and I'm going to do it. And they did. And that has gone to give hope. And in the midst of millions of dollars, is it a lot? No. But for them, it's all that they had. And they gave it for Jesus. And that is why we do the things we do here. And that is why in Hope Co. Kids, we are raising resilient disciples to be more like Jesus today than they were yesterday. So we're going to take a minute now, and we're going to also get to experience worship through generosity. And so I'm going to ask our ushers to please come forward, and we're going to receive our gifts and our tithes and our offerings. And there's a bucket at the end of each row on the left-hand side that you can pass down, or you can um, use the, the code on the, on the slide there to give to Hope Co. But will you pray with me, please, that the Lord can just receive these and bless them. Father God, we thank you so much for the faith of a child and for what we can be taught through it, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that as you receive these gifts, these ties, these offerings, these little pieces of who we are, the, the way that we give back to you for all that you have given us, Lord, we know that you can multiply it and use it for things greater than we could ever imagine. Not for our glory, not to say, look at what we did, but only for your glory, that we can say you are a good, good God who uses the small and makes it big for the weak, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, so I only have one announcement, but it's a big one. Are you buckled up? Trunk or treat is coming back. All right, so it's the Tuesday. That was a little lackluster. I appreciated the shout in the back, though. Thank you. That was, okay, a little lackluster, but let me just explain what this was. Okay, so it's the Tuesday before Halloween. It is going to be from 6 to 7.30, and we are going to have cars all through our parking lot decorated with candy, and all of these children in some costumes are going to come and receive. Now, we like to sugar them up and send them home. That's my goal. But more than that, we want families from the community to come to this place and to have some fun. But here's the deal. We need some cars. Now, my goal is 100 cars, okay, which is lofty, lofty. But we can do this, yes? I mean, how hard is it? You drive here, you open your trunk, throw a pumpkin in there, it's fine. It'll be great. It'll be great. And we would love the opportunity for you to participate in spreading joy and bliss to children, whether they live in these walls on a Tuesday night or they're here throughout the community. So you can look for me after the service. I'll be out there. Or you can go to thehopeco.com slash kids to sign up there. Well, we are in the midst of an amazing time learning how to grow. And so I'd last, like to ask Pastor Dave to come forward, and he's going to read the scripture for this morning. No, it's not. This is not Pastor Dave. This is... This. I'm not that handsome. Morning, my name is Goose. I don't know about you, but I'm still resting in the I'm His Beloved. So, what a wonderful morning. Uh, I ask you to stand because we believe here at the Hope Collective, the most important thing we'll do all day is spend time in His Word and to hear His Word. Uh, this morning, I'll be reading from Matthew 16, verses 24 
and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own ways, take your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. This is the word of God. Goose. You guys can have a seat. Good job. Beat me to it. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Alex. I'm one of the pastors here uh, with the Hope Collective. And can we just take a moment uh, to acknowledge what God has already been up to this morning? Uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and let's just take a moment in silence as we acknowledge the fact that God is already at work. And so as we take this moment in silence, we breathe in and are reminded that every breath we are given comes from God himself. And as we breathe out, we breathe out our gratitude to the one who loves us and is working in us and inviting us into what he's doing in the world. And so God, we thank you for what you have already done this morning. And we ask that you would give us open hearts and open ears for everything that you would have for us in these next few moments. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray and say, amen. Amen. It's so good to be together here in these moments and we gather to glorify God and we come into these moments to bring God our worship uh, based on what's happened this week. And as we step into this place and make it about him, he has the habit of turning around and blessing us because we're his kids and he loves us. And the gift of his presence and the gift of his people to be with one another is the invitation from God in these moments to each and every one of us. We are in uh, week two of our series called Grow, which is all about becoming more like Jesus. But before we get into all of that, I'd like to invite a little bit of interaction this morning. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to shout out your answer to this question one at a time, not all at once as you feel led, okay? So here's the question, don't answer right away, but the question is this. Who was one of your childhood heroes? Don't answer right away. But who was one of your childhood heroes? Now, this could be somebody that you knew in real life. This could be a celebrity that you looked up to. This could even be a completely fictional character that you just wanted to be like. But who was one of your childhood heroes? Just shout it out. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, yes. Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart, I love it. Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow. Where was over there? Jesus, here we go. Atreyu, I'm never-ending story. Never-ending story, Atreyu? Fantastic. Who else? Fonzie. Fonzie, nice. <laughs> Superman. Your dad. Aww. And we all said, aww. Dad, remember this moment. <laughs> Anybody else? Mighty Mouse. Hank Aaron. All right, one more. Walter Payton. Walter Payton. I thought for sure you were going to say Tom Cruise and Top Gun. I thought for sure that was going to be close second. Okay. Um, so I can't ask you guys to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So one of my childhood heroes, as a child growing up in the 90s, in 1997, Lucasfilm re-released what is arguably one of the greatest trilogies of all time, the original Star Wars. And in that moment, when they re-released A New Hope, I found a childhood hero for the next couple years in the character of Han Solo. And you're thinking, Han Solo? Harrison Ford's 1970s space pirate was Alex Gowler's childhood hero, absolutely. Because Han Solo is this character, if you've ever seen the movies, he is so cool. And he is so confident, which tells you a lot about little Alex's insecurities growing up. 
Not only that, but he has the Millennium Falcon, the spaceship that he can fly to literally anywhere with, and a seven-foot-tall best friend who has a habit of ripping people's arms off when he gets angry. Like, this is a cool character. And so I cannot tell you how many times I rewatch those Star Wars movies. I read all the Star Wars books. Like, guys, I was deep. I went as Han Solo for Halloween one year, and it was everything that I could. I wanted so much to be like this character, I could not get enough of getting into his head and what he was doing and all that. This idea and this experience of a childhood hero is something that's pretty common, almost universal to each and every one of us as we grew up to have this person that we aspired to be like, that we almost studied, that we became a student of so that we could be like this person. This is a universal thing. Something is so common to what it means to grow up and to be a child. And if we're willing, has a lot to teach us about this idea of spiritual formation. So when take this idea of childhood heroes, let's put it on the shelf for now and we're going to take it back down later. But like I said, we're in week two of our series called Grow, where we're talking about what does it mean for us to become more like Jesus. And this process of spiritual formation, which is the process of God doing things in us so that he can do things through us. And last week, we talked about how the purpose of spiritual formation, like why does spiritual formation exist? Why is it important in the first place is that God wants his goodness to saturate every single part of our lives, everything inside of us so that it can be expressed in everything that we do. The purpose of spiritual formation is that we would be able to be part of God's mission to reconcile all things to himself, to make everything good again, the things in here and the things out there. And we introduce this image of the tree, this picture that brings together all of these different ideas and concepts about spiritual formation into something that's very concrete and can tell us a lot about ourselves if we're willing to pay attention. And so even as much as we talk about the purpose of spiritual formation and what God wants to do, if there is a purpose to spiritual formation, then that should result in some sort of pattern that we get to look to. If, if, if God wants to do the same thing in every single one of our lives, if the purpose for every person who has ever been created is that the goodness of God would saturate every part of them and express itself in everything that we do, if that is the purpose of spiritual formation, then it should result in a pattern, something we can look to, a rhythm of life and a model that we see where we can know whether it's healthy, whether it's working, if this is actually taking place. The same thing is true with trees. Trees have a purpose. They exist to give life to the world. And if that's the case, then there's a certain rhythm, a certain way that a tree will look and grow and be cared for so that it can fulfill its purpose. There's a pattern that we have been given in scripture as to what does it look like for the goodness of God to saturate our lives and express itself into everything we do. And before we let the cliche Sunday school answer of Jesus just slip in and out of our minds, we have to pause for a moment and realize the audacity that according to God, the good life is modeled to us by a blue collar man from a backwater town who claimed to be God and was executed as a political revolutionary. This is the one that God would point to to say, hey, if you wanna know what it's like to live the good life, look to this person. The life of Jesus as a pattern that we are supposed to model ourselves after is how we fulfill the purpose that God has created us for. We live out the purpose of God by living in the pattern of Jesus. And this living into the pattern of Jesus and modeling ourselves after his life is what we call discipleship. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few minutes is this idea that learning to be like Jesus. Patterning our lives after Jesus is this process of learning how to live with and like him together. At the end of the day, that's what discipleship is. It is a posture that we take towards Jesus where we are learning how to live with him and like him together. So we're going to have this conversation for the next few minutes, but at the end of our time together, we also want to field some questions that may have been coming up from you guys as we introduced this topic last week, as you've been thinking about it this week, or even questions that you might have during our time together. So if there are questions that you have, we're gonna invite you to send them in. Text the word collective to 97,000, you'll get a reply back and just send your question. 
to that reply. And at the end of service, Pastor David and I are going to have kind of a question and response time. Uh, maybe not answers, but responses definitely to questions that you guys ask. So go ahead. And if you have any questions, go ahead and send that collective to 97,000 and then send in your questions. We'll talk about them at the end of our time together today. But this idea of discipleship, of patterning our lives after the life of Jesus is learning how to live with and like him together. We think about this idea of learning, most of us though, and it brings up these images of like school, of being in a classroom and hearing someone kind of talk at us about the things that we should know. And this is unfortunately uh, not the perspective on learning that scripture has in mind when it talks about becoming a disciple of Jesus. The uh, English word that we have, disciple, in our New Testaments is a translation of the Greek word mathetis, which can be translated as student or as learner. But we have this idea of learning and education that is this very kind of one-dimensional, like you have an expert that teaches you about one thing. And this is a very Western, very American, very kind of like, I just want your brain to get translated into my brain. I want to think like you think. So you can have a calculus teacher teach you about calculus, but you may not want that person giving you dating advice or talking to you about how you're supposed to treat your family or how to change your oil or how to throw a football. You can learn one thing from one person and that's what it means to learn. That's the education model that we have in our minds when we hear this word learning. This is not... The idea of learning that scripture gives us when it talks about becoming a disciple of Jesus. In Jesus' day, the education model that they had was this very multidimensional, all of life, ancient Hebrew understanding of what it means to learn from someone. Because when you learn from anyone, you don't just learn a system, you learn a person. And so what would happen is you would have students, learners, disciples become attached to a rabbi. And a rabbi was someone that you just didn't want to learn from. They were someone that you wanted to learn to be like. And so this rabbi wouldn't just teach you how to read Torah, wouldn't just teach you how to interpret or teach what you were reading. They taught you how to treat your family. They taught you how to manage your money. They taught you how to put on your robes in the morning. You were learning how to do all of life by spending time with your rabbi. And so when Jesus makes this invitation to come and follow him, to become his disciple, what he has in mind is this relationship with him that is not about just thinking what Jesus thought, but about becoming what Jesus was like. Spending time with him so that we could become like him. This was the idea of learning that Jesus had in mind and the posture of discipleship that he was inviting us to be a part of, to learn from him by living with him so that we could be like him. But this idea of living with and like Jesus, of finding the source of our life and fulfillment of our purpose by being with God and like God didn't begin with Jesus. Like we talked about last week, this idea of mission didn't start in the New Testament. It started way back at the beginning. This idea of living with and like God comes to us from the very beginning of humanity's story in Genesis 1 and 2, where in the beginning, God creates the world. He plants a garden and in it, he creates humanity. And it says in scripture that he walked with them in the cool of the day. The presence of God in a fullness that Adam and Eve were able to see him, to be with him, to work alongside him, to see the goodness that he had put in creation come forth and become something new and different and better. There was a presence of God in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were created to live in. And this idea of God's presence comes to us from Genesis 1 and 2 at the same time as we're introduced to this idea of God's image. And when we hear the word image, we tend to think of like a picture. An image is something that we would scroll past on our newsfeed or see in an article somewhere. It's something that kind of captures and resembles something that happened in real life, but it's this 2D flat kind of image, this picture that we have of something. The word that we use that is used in Genesis 1 when it talks about humanity being created in the image of God is translated in other places as statue, this kind of 3D model of something. And the idea was that back in the time when Genesis was written, 
There were these kingdoms and these emperors who would have these vast rules and reigns that they would never be actually able to visit the far corners of their kingdom because their kingdom was so large. And so what they would do is they would set up statues of themselves, images of themselves in the far corners of these countries to represent their character and will to the people who lived in that place. And so that image, that statue, if you ever wanted to know who was in charge and what they were like and what they wanted, you would look to that image and say, yes, that's the person who's in charge. When God creates humanity in his image, he is creating them as the representatives of his character and will in the world. And so from the very beginning, these ideas of God's presence and God's image, being with him and being like him, are baked into what it means for humanity to live out their purpose. And then in Genesis 3, we're reminded that this is the moment when everything went wrong. When rather than choosing to live with God in his presence and be like him, they want to take God's place and become God themselves. And in that moment, they are separated from God's presence and the image of God in them has been corrupted. The rest of the Old Testament is the story of God attempting to move humanity back towards himself, to restore his presence to humanity and restore the image that he has created them in. So you have this movement in the Old Testament where God rescues his people out of slavery in Egypt. And then he goes even farther to say, I don't want to just rescue you. I want to live among you. The book of Exodus and Leviticus, these detailed instructions for a tabernacle, a tent, a place where God would live among his people. Leviticus 26 saying that if you'll do what I've asked you to do, I will be among you. I will walk among you. I in my presence will be with you and I will be your God and you will be my people. That tabernacle eventually becomes the temple of Solomon. In 1 Kings 8, we have the story of this final completion of God's house in Jerusalem and God's presence comes to fill the temple in such a way that the priests who are doing their ministry can't even work because of the intensity of God's presence in that place. God was moving his presence back towards humanity to restore the relationship between the two of them, which is why one of the most tragic moments in all of scripture is Ezekiel 10, where the prophet who's living in a foreign land because Israel and the Jews have been exiled because of their turning away from God, Ezekiel has this vision of the presence of God finally leaving the temple as if to say, if you don't want me here, if you're not gonna follow me, if this relationship doesn't matter anymore, then I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna give you guys what you want. And at the same time as we have the story of the Old Testament of God trying to restore his presence in humanity, there's this desire of God to restore his image in humanity. The representatives who were supposed to be the ones to share God's character and his goodness and his will with the world. You have these roles of the prophet and the priest and the king that are woven throughout the biblical story. Prophets speaking God's words on his behalf. Priests serving the people and inviting them into an experience with God and kings who are exempt amplifying wholehearted devotion to God. And in all of those situations, we have shining moments in the stories of David and Moses and others. But as the story plays out, each of these people, the priests, the prophets, and the kings turn away from God and turn inwards. The prophets, rather than speaking what God wants them to say, begin to speak what people want to hear. Rather than the priests serving the people they say that the people need to serve them and the kings rather than showing what it looks like to have a wholehearted devotion to the Lord, spill their devotion everywhere else, all in the name of the good of the kingdom. And so by the time we get to the Old Testament, as we read, we're supposed to get to this place where we are longing for the return of God's presence and the restoration of his image to humanity, but there seems to be no hope. Humanity has literally driven God off the premises. And the image of God in humanity seems to be so corrupt that it will never be able to be restored. And it's in those exact same moments that we begin to have these whispers and these promises that God is not finished yet. And so the prophet Isaiah in chapter seven, verse 14, words that we usually don't read until Christmas, 
but it's a tragedy because it's a reminder of what God wants for us. Isaiah 7, 14, talking to King Ahaz, Isaiah says, all right then, the Lord himself is gonna give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In some way that he couldn't understand, Isaiah could sense that there was a return of God's presence that was going to happen through a human in a way that nobody could really wrap their minds around. At the same time, another prophet, Daniel, in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, he says he has this vision and he sees someone like a son of man, like a human, coming with the clouds of heaven and he approaches the ancient one, God himself, and was led into his presence. And this son of man was given authority and honor and sovereignty over all the nations of the world, the representative role that humanity was meant to fulfill in God's image. He's given all of this so that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him and his rule is eternal. It will never end and his kingdom will never be destroyed. Emmanuel, God with us. The son of man given rule, God's image restored in humanity. These whispers and these promises are given to those who are willing to hear and then there's silence and it's into the silence that we're introduced to Jesus, the one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, as 1 Corinthians 19 tells us, or Corinthians 1, 19. There's no 1 Corinthians. Wait, there is a 1 Corinthians. I'm confused right now. It's Colossians. Here's what happened, guys. I had a Bible, and then I left it there because there was a Bible up here, and then that Bible went away. So I'm Bibleless right now. I am, I am without a guide. So can I, I'm just gonna grab my Bible. Is that cool? Thank you. Hey, thanks guys. Scripture is, Scripture is our guide and boy did I need it apparently. So in only Colossians 1, <laughs> we're told in verse 15 that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. That image word used again as it talks about the person of Jesus. It goes on in verse 16 to say that through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can't see and the things that we can see. The thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world, everything was created through him and for him. This Jesus existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is the first in everything. And in verse 19, God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. There's that language again we talked about last week. And he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. When Jesus invites people to follow him, to become a learner, a life student, it is an invitation back into the presence of God and an invitation for the image of God inside of us to be restored. The whiff and the like. Discipleship to Jesus is what it looks like to live in the pattern that God has always intended for us and in so doing to fulfill the purposes he created us for. We are able to allow the goodness of God to saturate our lives and be part of everything that we do as we live with him in the presence of his goodness and allow that presence to shape us so that we can be like him. We fulfill the purposes of God by living in the pattern of Jesus. And this is the call to discipleship. This is what God has intended for each and every one of us. And we said that we're gonna be taking some questions about discipleship and spiritual formation, but before we do all of that, I wanna address one of the biggest objections that I encounter whenever I talk to people about this idea of becoming more like Jesus and discipleship is the question of, is this even possible? Like, we're talking about Jesus here. Like Jesus, who was perfect, and who, by the way, was also God. And I am not perfect, and I'm pretty sure I'm not God. 
So to become like Jesus just seems like this, this really far-fetched, out-there idea that can I, it, it's not possible. I can never be perfect like he was perfect. So this whole idea of spiritual formation and becoming more like Jesus, it's really not necessary. I just need to make sure that I'm saved and I tell a few people about Jesus before I see him face to face. That's really my responsibility. And there's a a couple responses to that. This idea that becoming more like Jesus is this impossible task. First of all, we don't let the impossibility of perfection stop us from just about anything else. I will never be a perfect husband. I will never be a perfect father. I will never be a perfect pastor. I don't let those things stop me from trying and learning and becoming something better tomorrow than I was yesterday. We don't let the impossibility of perfection stop us in any other area of life, especially the things that are most important. The second response that we could give to this is It seems like Jesus seems to believe that this is possible. When we look at his life and his teaching, he doesn't mince any words about the fact that one of the expectations of following Jesus and being with him is that you become like him. And so we have the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, where he says, come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you. Not the Western one-dimensional sit in a classroom and I'm going to talk to you, but become my disciple. Let me be your rabbi. Let me show you how to live all of life. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Luke Luke 6, 40. Jesus says, students are not greater than their teacher. Disciples are not greater than their master, but the student who is fully trained will become like their teacher. Every student of Jesus will become like him. And then John 14, 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done. They're going to be like me and they will do even greater works because I am going to be with the father. It would seem that Jesus believes more in our spiritual formation than we do at times. And if that's the case, that if we think it's not possible for us to become more like Jesus, then we have to say that this whole idea of spiritual formation has to go out the window. But based on the teachings of Jesus, if it's not possible, then Jesus himself is either terribly misguided or playing a cruel joke on us. If he's asking us to do something, it isn't actually possible. But here's the thing. It's not that spiritual formation is impossible. It's that it is not easy. Each and every one of us in this room I don't know if you know this, but you have spent your entire life becoming who you are today. That doesn't change overnight. That doesn't change without a fight. That doesn't change without our intention and cooperation with what the Holy Spirit wants to do in and through each and every one of us. And yet, patterning our lives after the life of another is something that we all know how to do because we did it when we were young. We had our heroes. We had these people that we looked to, that we wanted to be like, and so what did we do in the ways that we could? We spent time with these people. We watched their movies, we read their books, we saw their shows, we read the articles about them. We watched their games, we did all of that so that we could be like them. We took on their character and their hairstyles, we wore their jerseys, I say we, not me, I don't think I've worn a sports jersey since high school gym class. And even then it was against my will. But we want to be like these people and so we spend time with them. We try to take on their character. It's something that becomes so natural, but somewhere along the way we lose this desire of aspiration to become something different than we are. We lose this ability to dream and to be a disciple of someone, which I think is one of the reasons why Jesus says, if you want to follow me, if you want to inherit the kingdom, you have to become like a little child again. You have to learn what it means to admire someone and aspire to be like them. We already know how to do this but we've forgotten. And it's a lot easier to become something when you haven't become anything yet. 
That's why parenting and kids ministry and youth ministry is such an important role because we get to help guide kids into what they are becoming. But by the time we get to be adults, we've already constructed such a life and such a self. We've already been so shaped by the world and our own decisions that it's really, really difficult to become anything else. And Jesus isn't unaware of that. And he's very clear about what this change is going to require of us. That's why often when Jesus invites people to follow him, it's accompanied by this invitation to come and die. And so we have these words that Goose read for us earlier in Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you're going to save it. The idea of taking up your cross is the idea of a willingness to die. We often hear this as the words deny ourselves and think it has to do with like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give God my will. I'm going to say, God, whatever you want, you just do that. And I don't want anything anymore, which probably isn't true. We need to have some conversation about that. But this idea of denying ourselves and taking up our cross, Luke 9 would say, as he's kind of recounting the same teaching of Jesus, he would say, take up your cross daily is this invitation to take everything about our life so far and this self, this life that we have spent so many years constructing and to be willing to say goodbye to that so that we can receive what God has always intended for us. The command to come and die is an invitation to let the person that we have become and made ourselves to be, to see that person die so that we can step into the person that God made us to be, which looks an awful lot like Jesus. So as much as we talked last week about the purpose of spiritual formation, being God's goodness, saturating every single part of our life, the pattern that we live into is to follow Jesus, to learn how to live life from him, being with and like him. But the posture we take towards that is this posture of a willingness to put to death everything that we have been so far so that we can receive the new life that Jesus has to offer. We live into the purposes of God in spiritual formation as we follow the pattern of Jesus, learning to live with and like him and being willing to say goodbye to what was so that we can receive what Jesus has in store for us. So if you're willing to die the next six weeks, that's the invitation. Again, we said last week, clear as kind. The expectations that we have and that Jesus makes to us is that we would be willing to come to him and be changed. If you are willing to change, then we're gonna have some great conversations over these next six weeks. But it all comes down to how we think about our relationship and what it means to follow Jesus. Now, I said that we were gonna be taking uh, some Q&A. So if you have had a question over the past few minutes, Uh, go ahead and send that in. Again, text collective to 97000 and then send your question as a response. Uh, Dave has been getting those. He's going to come up here. We're going to field a couple of them. So I say to my kids all the time, um, the sign, one of the signs of your desire to learn is how good your questions are or that you ask them. So we have a couple. Okay. I'm not answering them alone. We're both answering these. <laughs> um, let's, let's, go with, let's go with this one first. Because this, this is, I don't, I don't think we understand fully and we're, we're learning the, the depth of what God wants to do in and through us and yet mm. how the enemy is also at work. Mm. The name of our soul. So why do I have a desire to be like Jesus, but can't seem to match my action with my desire? Hmm. So Alex, we're going to let you take that one. (laughs) That's a great question. What's next? No. Um, I'll repeat it. Why do I have a... And 
let me just, I'll just read it again. And if this is you, not, not you that asked the question, <laughs> but if you sense this in your own journey, just say, yeah, that, that's me. Uh, why do I have a desire to be like Jesus, but I can't seem to match my action with my desire? Mm-hmm. Does anybody ever find that? Yeah, so there's a lot of, like, Paul, I know the good I want to do, and I don't do it, and I don't know why I don't do it, but I don't do it, and I wish I would do it. <laughs> why? What do we do? <laughs> I think, um, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts yes. on this, too. Um, I think, Ruby, this whole idea of, like, having a desire to do something and knowing what that is and what you want to do but not being able to do it, what I encounter for me is that I have just built so many habits of not doing what God would want me to do, that that just takes a lot of time and a lot of intentionality. I think for a lot of us, how we want this to work is that, you know, we talked about 1 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, behold, I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That means that it should just be like this, right? Like I did all the dumb things and now I'm gonna do the Jesus things. Um, but it, it just doesn't work like that. And it takes a lot more time than we want it to for that desire to actually work its way into how we think and how we feel and the things that we do and the communities that we're a part of. Um, But it's a struggle because we will always know more about what God wants us to do than our ability to carry it out in the moment. So I think there's also the things that we don't know that are in our lives that are keeping us from doing the things of God. I think identity is huge wherever, and I'll say this is, is part of my journey with this, wherever my identity is based on what I do, what I have, or what people think about me, wherever that is, it exists, I will struggle to be like Jesus because I want to be like what everybody else wants me to be. Mm. And so my, I have yet to let my desire for what I really want, which is to be like the world, shift and be surrendered to God to be like him. So I would say it's a lack of awareness of what my actual desires are and not in a shame space. Um, I would also say that I think that so many of us have so much in our past that impacts our present negatively, even though the cross took care of it. Yeah. And there is a reason that when Peter denies Jesus three times at the fire, right, the coal fire, that Jesus takes him to another fire yeah. and takes him back to that moment and three times restores him. Why? Because had he never done that, what do you think would have stood in the way of Peter becoming like Jesus? All of the lies based around that rejection. All the lies based around that behavior. And so I do think that we've got to get honest with ourselves about what we actually desire. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's hard. Yeah. Right. Um, can I, can I riff off yeah, that real quick? Please. It reminds me, um, there's this quote from Dallas Willard. If you've read anything in spiritual formation, you've probably heard Dallas mentioned. Um, but he has this quote where he says, by the time we come to an age where we can wrestle with our faith and own it for ourselves, we have been so messed up and mangled by the world that a lot of God's grace has to be applied retroactively. And we have to go back to those places in a process of remembering and confession and sharing in community so that we can receive God's grace in its fullness for those moments and not just the moments from here on out. And so this idea, Mario in the back is like, yes, amen. Um, but this idea of embracing that in our stories is how we get to those roots of like, where is my identity? Where are my desires? And how do I get God's grace for those places, those tender and wounded places so that I can move forward? So how do I die to self and still have a good life? Hmm. <laughs> oh, to define that. Go ahead. It is, so even, even when we talk about um, the definition of hope, uh, and we've come up to this a, a few times, is the confident expectation of a better tomorrow. What does better mean yeah. to people? Because it really comes down to what your definition of good is. And here's the thing, is that we have, the very beginning, humanity's first sin was deciding that we had a better vision of what, God, what good is than God did. And so when we talk about how can I die to self and still have a good life, the question that we have to ask is what does the good life look like to you? How has that been defined for you? Who have you let define that for you? And is that in alignment with the good life as described in scripture and the life of Jesus? And for me, that's like 
that's the question that, that's the question behind the question. Not how do I have the good life, but who's telling me what the good life looks like. Which, which is huge because we sit here products of our family of origin, mm -hmm. our, our traumas, our abuses, our sins, our culture, the movies we love, the things we, I mean, somebody said recently, and I believe this, that if the disciples were to come back right now and sit in our movie theaters in America, they would say we are overtly demonic. I mean, flat out, what Disney is peddling right now is not the good life. Mm. We don't need witches and warlocks and warlords and all of that to have this good life. This, I mean, it, it's like sneaky. We're desensitized before we know it. I'm yelling. You're just excited. <laughs> I, I, I am. I think we're warped in what the good life is. I think we've been lied to. I think we need people in our life to call out that the thing we're pursuing that isn't Jesus isn't good. And, and to let Matthew 5, 6, and 7 be the definition of the good life because Jesus said this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom. And so when I look at my life in comparison to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, yeah. am I living that? Because he said this is, what, this is what it means to be blessed. Blessed are those, right? And so to just say, could I be like that? I just, I love that question. Oh, here's another good one. You ready? I'm ready. Everybody good so far? Not going to go. We'll do, we'll do one more. Is that all right? What inhibits us from being filled with God's presence and entering a life of discipleship? Mm. Come back next week and we'll talk about that. <laughs> no, and like I say that, and it sounds like a joke, but that's actually what we're going to be talking about next week is as much as we have an understanding of the purposes that God has created us for, we, have a, we can have a model, we can have the life of Jesus, we do not actually have the power to carry any of that out on our own. And it comes down to our willingness to not just invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, but also to follow his direction. And so we talk about the Father's mission, we talk about discipleship to Jesus, there's a missing person of the Trinity in all of this because spiritual formation is ultimately a work of the Holy Spirit. And we have to have an opportunity and a willingness to invite him in and respond to that. So next week. Okay. I do have one more because last week you talked about, or even Alex said it, that we could be cultural Christians and not disciples. Right. What is the risk of staying a cultural Christian? Mm -hmm. We're sitting in the room. We're like, I don't want to lean into this. I don't want to be, I, I got salvation. I've got a savior. When I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm good. I don't have to do the inner work to become like Jesus, which by the way, the inner work is to become like Jesus, not to become your better self, right. but to be the true self that God created us to be. There is a, there is a warpness to some spiritual formation in our culture that isn't this self-awareness. Yeah. It's this God awareness that informs who I am. But what's the risk of staying a cultural Christian? The Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, and words that haunt uh, some of us at times, is that we would do all the things that Jesus has asked us to do, but not actually know him. And that we would say that we are Christians because we are doing all of the right things, but we haven't actually entered into a relationship with the Savior. And so for Jesus to be there and for us to see him at the end of time, Jesus tells the story of like, but, but Jesus, we did all the things. Like we did all the miracles, we fed the poor, we, we had a hope center, we did all the things. And Jesus looks at us and says, who are you? Cultural Christianity versus life learners of Jesus, that is the distinction. Are we just doing the things that we're supposed to do or are we actually in a relationship with the Savior who is empowering all of that? Not just giving us a form of godliness, but the actual power to live it out. I had a question that I wanted to ask, and I know, Steph, you did too. We'll do this again in this series. We'll have some time to do this. But I do want us at some point, this was my question, is I think that we think we can become like Jesus and still keep anything but a biblical worldview. I, I think we think that we can think like the world and add the things of the world into a worldview that isn't biblical and still think we can be becoming like Jesus. And that would be really interesting to flesh that out a little bit. Would you stand with us this morning? It was just a phone. It's of the world. See? It's good. 
<laughs> let's, let's pray that God's will be done. Not ours, but his ultimately. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May you have an amazing week that honors Jesus. We love you all.